Hello, welcome to the a great uh, session that we have planned today on the patient experience and uh, with a focus on COVID-19 ECMO. Today, we are very glad to have uh, reintroduced to our program a live patient experience of two patients that suffered very severe COVID-19 and required ECMO for months. One of our patients, uh, Maria Young, had lung recovery and will share her story, while Mr. Valdez's lungs did not recover but subsequently underwent a lung transplantation. They're both doing well and are here today to share their story. Without further ado, we'll allow Maria Young to share her story with us. Thank you, Dr. Bush. And uh, thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to be here and share my story. Just to get started, this was me um, in January. So I was a severe COVID-19 ECMO survivor. I spent 130 days in the hospital, 69 on BV ECMO and over hundred days intubated. I was deemed a single organ failure, but I was also not eligible for transplant. So this is a this image was taken um, kind of during the, the last bit of my ECMO run where they tried to prone me and I became the first patient at Hopkins with a trach and ECMO to be proned. And I'm here to share my story about what I went through, what um, being sick during during this time really meant for me and my family. Um, let's so before COVID, I kind of had a very full life. I was doing military style boot camp. I did a lot of yoga. I had actually in uh, Feb end of February just gotten back from a yoga retreat in Mexico with friends and family. I was able to celebrate one of my good friends' weddings, um, which I planned in six weeks. And I was actually um, career-wise, I am usually on the other side of this type of event and I'm an event planner. Um, I do plan the annual PCORI meeting, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with PCORI. They do a lot of grant funding and medical research. And I also helped uh, then Vice President Joe Biden um, plan his Cancer Moonshot Summit several years ago. So a little bit of the timeline of my diagnosis to actually ending up at ECMO, on ECMO. I uh, had two negative P PCR tests in October um, and I, was they thought I had a, a seasonal virus and I just kept feeling worse and worse. And I went to the hospital and they discharged me to a rehab facility where I stayed for two days and then was um, once again discharged home where I just continued to deteriorate. In early um, November, I actually called the ambulance for myself and they measured my oxygen level at 40 at that time. So I was really rushed into the ICU at a local hospital where um, you know, my family didn't get to see me. They didn't really know what was going on. Um, I, you know, my oxygen was low. I was really not communicating a whole lot with them. Um, and one night uh, my family kind of gets, my mom got a phone call early in the morning and they, um, they'd been working to transfer me to Hopkins actually. Um, the whole time I was there, they knew that I needed to be at a more a larger facility with more um, more support. And so in the middle of November, she gets a phone call um, saying Maria just arrived at Johns Hopkins and we have to place her on ECMO. And, you know, her first immediate response was what's ECMO? Not, you know, it's not really a well-known um, course of treatment or it wasn't until COVID. Um, but she, I have lots of doctors in my family. Actually, I'm really lucky. And she said, I need to call my sister who is a neurologist. And um, she had two minutes and she didn't get to make the phone call. Uh, Hopkins called back and said, this is it. And so with my sister and my dad, they said, if this is our only choice, we have, we have to do it. So I did spend um, quite some time on ECMO. Um, and, you know, during during the time before I got to Hopkins, when I was at a local hospital, uh, we really struggled because, as you know, nobody was allowed to see me or allowed in the hospital. So we had this false sense of security of what was happening. I didn't realize how sick I was when my oxygen was in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. I They had placed me on all the different cannulas and that sort of thing. Um, but I wasn't telling my parents everything or I didn't understand everything. And the doctors really had a hard time um, understanding that I wasn't as coherent as I appeared to be. I've had the, heard the term happy hypoxia lately, and 
this is kind of an idea of what that looked like for me. So I was, you know, making jokes. This is hours before I was intubated and transferred to Hopkins overnight. So I'm more concerned about my graham cracker stash being taken by the ICU gangs uh, than, than I was about me being intubated and about to, you know, be transferred to a pretty high level hospital with, you know, potential for, for ECMO treatment. So while I was on ECMO, I of course faced a ton of different challenges, um, all the ones that you've ex you would expect. Um, so I won't touch on all of them, but this is kind of a list of some of the things I faced along the way. Um, I think there's a few that I just wanna point out and talk a little bit more in detail about. Um, being alone and waking up from all the sedation medications was the hardest mentally uh, challenging thing I think I could ever imagine. Um, the fear and the unknown and the not understanding and not really comprehending why I couldn't see my friends or family and why no one was there to really explain things to me. Um, and of course, when I was on ECMO and sedated, they had asked my mom, why, uh, what kind of shows do I like? What should they be playing in the background? What kind of music? And I guess they made the big mistake of saying I loved Law and Order and Below Deck because most of my delirium and my hallucinations were revolved around being kidnapped and um, held captive on a cruise ship. So, you know, on some level, I guess I was paying attention to uh, what was on the TV and what I was hearing. And I also woke up thinking that, um, my cousin Michelle had passed away in Spain and that I had adopted her five-year-old daughter. And that was kind of the piece of the delirium that really stuck with me for a long period of time. Even after you know, I was able to see my mom, even after I had talked to Michelle, it was really tough for me to get, get past that. Um, all right. So I think one of the, one of the um, really scary things for my friends and family was you know, knowing how I was going to come out of this, if I was still going to be myself, if I was still going to have my sense of humor. And this was actually the first text that I sent to my friends um, when I got my phone back. And this is a picture of pre, pre ECMO because I did not look quite that good coming out. Um, but it just let my friends know that, that I was here, that it was me, that we would get through this. And it was, um, it was really reassuring for them when they knew my sense of humor was still there. So some things that worked for my family and that might be helpful for other families as they navigate this process is it was really important for my friends and family and community to make sure my doctors had a connection to me and to know who I was and who I, they wanted me to still be when I came out of Hopkins. Um, they wanted them to know my sense of humor, my smile. So not only did they um, tell stories about me, but they also made sure there were photos of my friends and family in the ICU with me. Um, and again, I was alone the whole time, most of the time. So that was really important because they wanted me to feel um, surrounded by love if I did wake up or if I did come out of sedation a little bit. Um, and also what we, what we found was really difficult or what they found was really difficult was when my mom would get the phone calls from the doctors, which obviously could come at any time of the day, it was one person kind of hearing the information. And by the time she kind of let other friends and family members know, the information had kind of changed a little bit or you know, not all the details were there. So something that, that kind of helped my, friend, my, fr my friends and family um, was to have a weekly call with, with my main team who was taking care of me at that time. And they included my family doctors from all over the world and my parents and my sister and they were really able to level set and understand what was going on at the time and hear the same information. Uh, and one of the other really scary times during my treatment was when palliative care was brought in. I work in health communications. I even had a misunderstanding of what palliative care is. My, one of my good friends is a cancer doctor. She, she got really worried when palliative care was brought in to help me. So I think kind of re, you know, doing what we can to kind of explain, um, you know, what palliative care support actually means. It doesn't mean, you know, you're, you're kind of not being treated anymore. It doesn't mean your life is definitely ending, um, which is a connotation that it, that it clearly has across the community. Um, so, I mean, as you can imagine, this, this was sort of a life-changing event for me. I have changed my priorities in life. I've changed uh, what's important to me. And I want to help others. I want to help others um, have an easier time of a process like this than I did. 
So I'm in the process of establishing a nonprofit organization called Maria's Miracle. And we've already gotten some really, taken some really big steps and have gotten, um, you know, some, some really good support behind us. So we're, we're in the last uh, couple steps of doing that. But let's talk a little bit about why I'm doing this. When uh, I was sick in the States and in the best possible hands I could have been, uh, we had a family member in Ecuador who came down with COVID and she passed away the week that I came home from the hospital. And just the, the clear difference in care and access to treatment that I had versus what she had was just so evident. Um, and I wanna try to change that. I wanna try to reduce the, the access to critical care across our country and hopefully internationally one day. So I'm working to train to help fund medical training in critical care and also you know, develop some sort of toolkit, a roadmap for families who are facing the same thing that my family faced. You know, what tips and tricks did I learn along the way? I've kind of established this community across the country and actually internationally about, you know, with other survivors. And obviously not everyone was on ECMO for 69 days. Not everyone had the, you know, was alone. Um, all our stories are a little bit different, but some of the underlying um, experiences are the same. And it's been really therapeutic for me to be able to, you know, I don't, I mean, one of the silly parts is that of one of the girls who um, she was treated in Florida on ECMO, we compared um, bed sores the other day. Um, we just sent pictures of each other's, we had each had a pressure sore in our head. So just having someone who kind of gets it and gets the process that our bodies went through has been really helpful for me. So I want to be able to expand that beyond, um, you know, just the small network to, to help others as we go along this. So I invite you to kind of come along with us. Um, there's a, on the website, there's a, a place that you can sign up for updates and we'll keep you posted. Um, I've also been doing a lot of volunteer work with um, Yellow Heart Memorial, which is an amazing COVID memorial organization that has um, memorials popping up all over the country to honor those that we've lost. And they're also now starting to um, honor long haulers who are really struggling, obviously across, you know, kind of all different kinds of, of problems and long-term effects and sharing their stories because, you know, long haulers and everyone who has an illness kind of wants to know that they're not alone. So I encourage you to, you know, let your patients know about those those resources. And um, I think that's it. So thank you again. I'm happy to expand on anything that I didn't touch on. I'm pretty much an open book. So thanks. Well, thank you, Maria. That is a, a wonderful story that uh, just remarkable what you went through and that you're able to share it to us, share it with us in such a, a remarkable way. Um, let me just use the numbers you gave 130 hospital days, 69 PV ECMO days, 100 days intubated, and obviously a, a, a very long, prolonged course. Mm -hmm. What is it that you remember first? I know you talked about the delirium, but when, yeah. when do you remember in your course being coherent and actually knowing what was going on and what was that like? Okay, so I came off of ECMO kind of around the, the 20th of January, and I don't really remember anything until like the 8th, 9th of February. So I was off of ECMO for probably, I don't know what that is, 10 days, 11 days uh, before I start remembering anything. And I just, one minute, I'm just like kind of sucked into reality, I remember. And I was in the pulmonary unit by that point. So I was out of ICU. I was kind of in the step-down unit. Um, and I just remember all of a sudden asking questions. And I remember being really scared. I, um, I didn't sleep for six days. I was just didn't know what my didn't understand what my prognosis was, what the future was for me. If I fell asleep, I was afraid that I wasn't going to wake back up. And really, you know, at, at, I, I'm sure they explained to me kind of a, along the way what had happened, but this is the moment. There's a moment that you just start remembering and start realizing. And um, it was scary, especially because I begged for, my, for them to let my mom come. And at that point, you could have one visitor a week. Um, I didn't have access to my phone. I didn't really have the capability to move my hands or communicate all the way. Uh, so that was a, the scariest time because I just didn't understand what the future was. Um, and thank goodness for nurses. I had some amazing nurses. Um, the first time I slept at all was a nurse offered to sleep, to sit in my room and do her notes at night. 
And that was the only way I was able to really sleep. But it took weeks after that to really understand the, the passing of time um, and to understand that there was a new president, that you know all these things had happened while I was asleep um, and to understand what had happened. I remember asking what ECMO was like 10 times because I couldn't even remember the letters. So your brain is trying so hard to grasp reality and to seem coherent and you're not able. I, I remember having conversations with friends um, early on and I thought I was being very clear about, I thought I was with it and that I was communicating very clearly. And they say now that, no, I really wasn't. Um, it was really hard. Obviously it was hard for them emotionally to hear me in, in panic. Um, but that was the only way I got through that is really just staying on the phone with people all day, whether I said anything or no, it was the only way I didn't feel alone. Yeah. And thanks for sharing. I, I think it's very hard also as the physicians to understand at which point you also become coherent and are no longer delirious because we can be interacting with you and you seem fine. And sounds like you also thought you were fine, but totally not. 